What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com. Today we'll talk Razorback football, basketball, baseball as always. So the football team just 100 days out from the start of the season against Portland State. Of course, we talked about that Ole Miss game being a huge one. Basketball team picked up a big commitment from J.D. Note, a guard uh, out of Jacksonville. And baseball team in full swing with the postseason. We'll get into all of that and more with Danny West and Pete Rullier. It's all, hopping, it's all happening on Hogsports Live. All right, so first with the baseball team, they've got a 4.30 game today against Georgia Bulldogs. We're not going to talk too much about that just because so many people uh, have uh, probably are listening to this after the game has already occurred. So um, I want to remind everybody that there are plenty of ways to listen. You can watch on Facebook Live like you're probably doing now, YouTube. Uh, it's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I want to remind you to like, share, follow, comment if you haven't done so already. Give us that thumbs up. Helps us get our message out there. And if you're listening on podcasts, be sure to throw us five stars and throw us a review. That definitely helps us get our rating out there. So we would love a review. Be sure to subscribe on podcast also so you'll be notified anytime we have new shows. Uh, I want to also go ahead and encourage you to go ahead and get your questions in for Danny West and Pete Roulier. Um, just to go over a couple of things real quick here, 100 days out from football, we've talked about that Ole Miss game. It's the second game of the season, how big it is for recruiting because so many players seem to look at that 2-10 and 10 record, and if Arkansas can get past that Ole Miss game, uh, then they start off 2-0, and 0, probably starting off 4-0 and 0 with almost five games guaranteed. So um, uh, we mentioned the baseball team. They play at 4.30 today at Hoover Metropolitan Stadium against the Georgia Bulldogs. And then, of course, everybody's focused on regional, super regional possibilities. We'll talk more about that with Pete. Also want to talk a little bit about uniforms. We're not far away from when Arkansas should be unveiling the new uniforms. So we'll get into all that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and bring Pete's graphic up. Hopefully everything works. We had a little bit of audio issue earlier, but hopefully things have gotten straightened out here. That's encouraging. Hey. What's up, Pete? How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. How are you? Pete Roulier joining us here on Hog Sports Live. And Arkansas has got a big baseball game today against Georgia. We don't want to focus too much on that just because uh, some of the people listening. But for uh, just a brief overview, what can we expect mm -hmm. today against the Georgia Bulldogs? Well, I like the pitching matchup. Um, Arkansas is going with, of course, their ace, Isaiah Campbell. Against Cole Wilcox, who's a f true freshman, he's three and one this year. Started out in the bullpen, kind of trying to find his way. So, I like the pitching matchup there. And then, I think Arkansas really is. This is going to be one of the games. Their bats have been kind of dormant for a while, and with a lineup as potent as Arkansas is, they're kind of due for a big game. So, I actually like Arkansas in this game to the pitching matchup, and then maybe maybe they get the bats going too. So, Pete, how do things shape up if Arkansas gets past Georgia today? So if Arkansas beats Georgia, then they're going to advance to the semifinals, which start on Saturday. Mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely best-case scenario because if they lose, then they're going to have to play either the winner of the game that's going on right now between Texas A&M and Ole Miss. Um, so they'd have to play tomorrow. And mm -hmm. I think best-case scenario is you just go ahead and win this game and then get to the semifinals, whatever happens, happens. They don't want to play more games than they have to, is what I'm trying to say. So mm -hmm. I think they definitely want to win this game and play Saturday in the single elimination part of the tournament. Pete Royer joining us from hogsports.com. Pete's been with us for several months now, doing a great job covering baseball, also does basketball recruiting stuff, helps out with that, and, of course, football. Um, and uh, and done a little bit of football, I guess, from, from last spring. Pete, we're 100 mm -hmm. days out. You're going to start rolling out some uh, jersey number articles, I guess, coming up soon. What do, you, what do you think about football just 100 days out now? Football 100 days out, it's honestly pretty crazy. It seems like it was just – not too long ago, I guess maybe because I've been covering baseball. And it's been a mm -hmm. long haul, but yeah, I'm definitely excited about it. And uh, this hundred days of a hundred jerseys is going to be a lot of fun. I think people are going to like it, and I uh, get to know some of the guys that maybe they aren't very familiar with, and maybe some guys that you know people don't pay a lot of attention to, but could mm -hmm. have a big year. Yeah, I think it'll be a nice feature. It actually won't start until I guess we get to 94 days in because David Porter's the first <laughs> right. jersey. So uh, it's hard no to 99s. Kick off That's kind of surprising, right? No 99, but one. I figure maybe one of the freshmen will 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 go with number 99. I could maybe like an Enoch Jackson or a Torian Carter or something yeah, like that. Yeah, the 99 is always fun to root for. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a good number. Um, okay, Pete, what else in baseball? What kind of the schedule coming up with um, regional possibilities, super regionals, college World Series, any of that stuff that you can uh, share with us? 
Well, right, yeah. After, after the tournament's over, then they're going to go straight to the regional. And then I I think at this point, Arkansas is going to be a lock. So probably going to get two weekends in Bomb Stadium, which is going to be great for the fans. And maybe they'll break that record that they've been trying to set all year long due to weather. Mm-hmm. Just because, I mean, there's been a couple opportunities and the team's so good this year for them to break the record, but weather's kind of held them back. So there's going to be two big weekends, two big opportunities to uh, – break the record i think one really intriguing possibility is the fact that oregon state and arkansas have kind of been matched up in some of these um preseason or before the uh, the project predictions for the super regional mm-hmm. so having oregon state in, in fayetteville that's something that really excites a lot of people and it'd be a great redemption i think arkansas would love to host oregon state in the super regional and get get them back so but that that's kind of what's coming up and like I said, Arkansas is definitely a lock to host the Super Regional at this point, especially with mm-hmm. that win yesterday. And that, that's that's what I'm kind of thinking for the SEC tournament. Coach Van Horry said he wants to win it, but he's, he's just kind of showing at this point. He knows what he's got locked up, and that that's where they're at right now. So that's where they are. Yeah. Well, I got to go ahead and, and burst your bubble a little bit, Pete. They're not going to set an attendance record as long as they have tickets scanned numbers oh my gosh as long as they're using the scanners they're not gonna they're not gonna break the record there's no way isn't that insane (laughs) like here's the thing wouldn't you want i mean as an athletic department wouldn't you want the numbers to be a little skewed in your favor instead it's like the exact opposite i mean you don't want to cheat people and like lie about it but i mean for the most part it, it would seem way more accurate when they were not doing the scan and then i've literally seen people I'm going up to the press box at Bomb, and people are like, well, I think it doesn't scan. And she's like, oh, man, let me look at it. Mm-hmm. All right, go ahead. You're good. <laughs> she's like, it's the same. Yeah, I, I don't agree. get it at all. I agree. What's the biggest hurdle for this team right now um, as they uh, eye the regional? Well, I was thinking maybe it was the bullpen. Just They've been a little shaky as of late, and then Patrick Wicklander. But uh, Patrick Wicklander and the bullpen looked really good yesterday, so that, that was a good sign for Razorback fans. So mm-hmm. I think it's going to be the freshman pitcher in big situations. How can they handle it? And then it's the uh, the bottom of the order needs to get going. The beginning of the year was uh, everyone was hitting top to bottom. Then at the end of these SEC games, um, kind of Christian Franklin's been struggling a little bit from the plate. Casey Opitz and Jacob Nesbitt, those three at the bottom of the order. They really need to get it going. If, if you're gonna if you're gonna make it all the way to the uh, championship game like they did last year, you need everybody to be hitting top to bottom. But uh, I'm definitely not concerned about the top six in the lineup right now. They've been they've been on fire, especially Jack Kenley. So if anybody if everybody can be hitting like Jack Kenley is right now, all these role players, I think I think they're in a good spot. Pete Royer joining us here from Hogsports.com. So they got the regional, they got the super regional. And, mm-hmm. and then a, possibly a college World Series. That's good news for us. I guess I don't have to send you to a, a Super Regional if you think they're a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's good for me, too. I don't really feel like traveling for the next like month or so. But, yeah. no, absolutely, yeah, it's definitely a lock. And I would just say this SEC tournament, I mean, I love covering it. This has been a really fun SEC tournament. Every game has been really close. Mm-hmm. I mean, this game right now is still tied. Um, I actually stayed up till 4.30 in the morning last night watching uh, LSU and Mississippi State. I turned it on about 11. I was like, oh, yeah, it's like the 10th inning, you know? <laughs> and then it just kept on, kept on going. Yeah. And the people on the SEC Network, I think it was Kyle Pearson and Tom Hart, they got to give them – they were absolutely hilarious. It was like slap happy <laughs> yeah. at 4, 3 o'clock in the morning just making every, like, borderline joke they could make, just trying to get through it. I mean, that's just – that's what baseball is all about. It was a lot of fun and – I'm excited to see what happens in the SEC tournament. It's fun to be a part of. A lot of people think Isaiah Campbell got snubbed for uh, all SEC. Do you, do you uh, think that stuff matters that much? We were talking the other day on right. another show uh, just about nobody seeing – it's not that big a deal, all SEC stuff. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know. I think that's kind of a big deal, Isaiah Campbell well, getting snubbed. This, especially, the, I mean, him, the individual, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a big deal. You get to say that for the rest of your life. You're all SEC, which is – a huge ordeal but in the scheme of things Danny did a great job breaking down the numbers yeah it really is if you if you look at it from an outsider's perspective it's hard to choose between all these great SEC pitchers so I mean maybe he did get snug but I, this year I mean it, it doesn't matter because the eyes are set in Omaha if it was a down year that I could see why I was a little upset but I, th- I think he's got bigger goals than all SEC yeah, so Danny breaks it down and's got Isaiah Campbell at ten and one with a two point five ERA, ninety seven mm-hmm. strikeouts, um, ninety innings pitched. 
And, uh, yeah. It's insane it, it, that he hasn't got 100 strikeouts yet, and all those other guys got 100 strikeouts. It's, uh, and then I think Danny brought it up, too, though. Those other guys are playing in the East. Yes. While Isaiah Campbell's playing in the West, which is, I mean, Vanderbilt's in the East. But after that, I mean, they're going to play Georgia today, so you're going to see what Georgia's got. Mm-hmm. Now, but, I think I mean, the West is stacked. If, if all SEC stuff doesn't really matter that much, which I think it does. I, I mean, I, I remember as a kid always, a always going over that kind of stuff and seeing who made the team and stuff. But – Something that does matter is coach of the year to me. And I don't see how Dave Van Horn, when you look at every – and I'm not a baseball expert. Most people mm-hmm. who know me know that. That's why you're on here. But when you <laughs> yeah. look at when you look at everything he did, replacing his pitching coach, all the players that he had to replace on the roster from last year's World Series to be in a position that they're in right now, it just makes sense that he would be – I mean, Vanderbilt was preseason everything, right? So they did what they were supposed to do. Right. No, that's that's what coach of the year is. That's why, I mean, in football, you see it all the time. They, they're never going to pick Nick Saban anymore. It's like Nick Saban can't win coach of the year because that's what he's expected to do yeah. every year, right? It was kind of like Michael Jordan. They were just looking for somebody else to give the uh, player of the year. Yeah, or, Le- to. or LeBron James, something yeah. like that, yeah. And, no, David Horn did an amazing coaching job. And then he was actually praising his pitching staff. I mean, the whole staff is an amazing job this year, just getting these guys – in the position they are right now with so many young people too Mm -hmm. and uh like like uh like a lot of people are saying right now it's hard not to look at this team and get excited for next year with so many young pieces and uh they get another year under van horn who's one of the best coaches in in the in the in the country Mm -hmm. so another year under van horn in an already phenomenal freshman season with so many of these young guys it's, it's it's hard not to look to next year so yeah i think i think he was definitely stuff for coach of the year and one more snub was Casey Opitz, who had more um, – he caught more people stealing, mm. had less pass balls than Cooper Johnson from uh, Ole Miss. And it, it was the numbers were heavily in his favor, 100%, and, he, and they gave us Cooper Johnson. It's probably because Cooper's a little better at the plate and they wanted to give him something. But Casey Opitz got snubbed 100%. And mm. that, that's the biggest snub for me. All right, Pete. You got any other takes you want to bring up here? Non baseball well, or baseball? Yeah, I do. Your, your I do want to see. If, I do see if you want to recall. We had a conversation ten weeks ago. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah. Well, we don't. We don't yeah. want to. We don't want to spoil it for anybody. But you were right. Okay. You were right. All right. I just. I, as much as it, as to. much as it, we're talking about Game of Thrones and the way it ended, and I'm sure several of you have watched, but I don't want to spoil it for anybody that didn't watch. But okay. Pete made a comment about who would uh, sit on the Iron Throne technically. And you shot me down. Real right. Bad. But technically, I can't say what I want to say because I'll spoil it. But all right. Uh, all right. I'm I am, I I am with uh, what is 8 million people who've signed a petition to, <laughs> to, really? to treat this whole season as canon and just uh, redo the whole thing. So a lot of people are, are disappointed in the way um, things ended with Game of Thrones, but gave us uh, seven great seasons and uh, an unfortunate ending, which happens with a lot of shows. I, I never got into Lost, but apparently that was a big thing with Lost. Um, some people argue that Seinfeld didn't have a very good ending. I was kind of okay with it. It wasn't a great ending. Breaking Bad had a phenomenal ending, but right. um, I can't say that. For no, Game I thought I'd bring that up, rushed. but I just think that if you, I know a bunch of people are busy at work, but. If you get a chance, just tune into the SEC tournament right now. It's a lot of fun to watch. Mm-hmm. There's some great baseball going on, and a lot of the teams are still playing for something. So, if you, if you have time, tune into that. It's been real fun. So, that's right, it for Pete. me, man. Sign off. Okay, man. Appreciate you joining right. us. That's Pete Roulier with hogsports.com. Pete's doing a great job for us. If you want to read his stuff, go to hawgsports.com. All right. Let's get to a couple of questions here before we bring in Danny West. Randy Smith says, what's up? What's up, Randy? Did you see ESPN's post of the punt return? I did not. I assume you mean Joe Adams' punt return. I did not see the post, though, but um, pretty special punt return. Joe Adams was snubbed on Athlon's list of um, – or no, excuse me, they didn't do special teams. We were talking about that on drive time yesterday. They didn't do special teams, but Joe Adams, I think, would make uh, the punt returner. Uh, let's see what else. Dustin Hoofman says, what impact has the return of Hammonds made on the team morale and his term to the football field? Well, first of all, they haven't really announced that T.J. Hammonds has returned to the football team. T.J. said that. Um, I know when we had Jeff Trailer on the hog hustle the other day, 
he wasn't really ready to comment on it because Chad Morse hadn't commented, but I don't see why they wouldn't add him. They need running backs to the roster. They need people that can at least carry the ball. So I think it makes sense to add T.J. Hammonds. The thing with T.J. is he's got to stay healthy. He gets hurt most of the most of the time to open the season. I don't think he was last year, but the two at some point he was hurt. And a couple of times he's had knee, his knee scope from a, a meniscal tear. And so he's, he's kind of dealt with some injuries here and there. And um, – well, last year he had the knee issue into the season. He had an ankle injury. So he's got to stay healthy. I always think back to the Coastal Carolina game where he saved Arkansas. Otherwise, Brett Bielema gets fired on the, on the field if, if T.J. Hammonds doesn't go off there. What's the health status of the running back room? Whaley Hayden, uh, Boyd especially. Well, right now with the running backs – um, everybody's expected to be full go. Now, Devwall Whaley missed a significant amount of time in the spring. Rakeem Boyd missed virtually all the spring, except for doing some light handoff stuff in a yellow jersey. Uh, but Boyd, come, Boyd had the shoulder surgery. He had to have the shoulder surgery. It plagued him since junior college. Uh, I think I've said before that if he stays healthy all season, Boyd's going to be a 1,000-yard back and probably declare for the NFL draft early. Being a fourth-year junior, I could absolutely see him going that direction. Uh, Whaley looks trimmed up to me. You know, I thought that he looked trimmed up last year. You know, you could kind of see his cheeks a little more hollowed out. Um, he looks even more trimmed up this year, so hopefully that will add a little bit of speed for him and, um, and not take away – um, any power that he has. Uh, Chase Hayden, I thought, was a disappointment last year in the way he played because this was a guy who, broke before he broke his foot, broke his leg against Auburn you know, on a long run, he was a guy that everybody was talking about. I can remember when coaches were saying – after the first game, you guys haven't even seen anything yet with Chase Hayden. You haven't seen what this guy's capable of. And then in the next game against TCU, he gets like two carries in the first half, and they're like, well, he just wasn't ready for that stage. He wasn't ready for the stage. Arkansas scored one touchdown in the game. So was everybody else ready for that stage against TCU, but, but Chase Hayden wasn't? I don't know. Kind of blows my mind. But there are a couple of guys that have been a little disappointing. I mean, if you look at Devwall Whaley from his freshman – sophomore to junior seasons and in junior season he was definitely banged up a lot last year but his numbers have gone down his rushing totals have gone down each year uh chase hayden went from being the next big running back at arkansas to really i mean kind of buried on the depth chart last year tj hammonds was a former four-star recruit a top 250 player in the country and really i mean he's been banged up so much he's shown flashes but under bielham it was like if he didn't do something if he doesn't have a big play then you know, pull him out of there and it's over. And, and the whole time they're trying to run in between the tackles. It's not his game. I could see Hammonds as a guy that could float in and out from wide receiver to running back, pre-snap, end rounds, those types of things I see as a role for him. Uh, Dame Dallas says, any idea who our best foul in the O-line is thus far? It's difficult. I think you've got a competition. So – they're going to have to move some guys around, in my opinion. I've said before I'd like to see Shane Clinton get some work at center because I don't really think Ty Clary is being pushed that much by Silas Robinson. I think Silas has a future. I just don't know that he's quite ready right now. Um, so I look at that situation and I say – it gives Shane Clinton a little bit more. He does pre-practice reps at center. Uh, but, you know, if Chaboisian Juan is a guy that can emerge and be a starter, I see him fitting in as a guard position. Uh, at right tackle, you've got a good competition with Nate Dalton and Dalton – Nate – Nate Dalton Wagner and Nate Dalton. Um, you've got a good competition with those two guys. I think that Nate Dalton might end up emerging there as your right tackle, um, your right guard. I've, I've said my piece on that. But, I, you know, right now it's Shane Clennon, Ty Clary at center. Left guard, you've got Austin Katz. Maybe that's a position where you could see a little more competition, maybe with uh, Chaboise and Juana or Myron Cunningham. You know, My, if, if Colton Jackson – if they decide Colton Jackson one of their best five moving forward, then, you know, Myron Cunningham, that makes sense for him to move into guard. I think he's more of a guard possibility than than Colton Jackson. But if Myron Cunningham – if Colton Jackson isn't one of the best five, then you see Myron Cunningham at left tackle. So, um, there's a lot of possibilities there, really. I mean, which is a good thing. I mean, they're going to have 16 scholarship offensive linemen when Luke Jones uh, enrolls. I don't know that he's going to be granted immediate eligibility, but – Still 16 guys on the roster. Last year, there was most of the time they had like eight healthy scholarship offensive linemen, and some of those weren't quite ready to contribute. Now you've got some guys who are redshirt freshmen, redshirt sophomores that are moving up a little bit and should start being ready to contribute. So a lot healthier position on the offensive line. Nope, it was North Texas return for ESPN. Oh, that one. Yeah, that's not the punt return you want to see. That's the thing that 
kind of stunk about that game. Not only do you get waxed by North Texas, but they had this crazy punt return that you know was going to way increase the amount of times that they showed that game for everybody to see. Uh, early to say, but do you think Starkle starts over Hicks? I think that they go back and forth. I say day one starter is Hicks. I think I think they go back and forth for a little while, but I think kind of by the Texas A&M game, you might see Nick Starkle in there, largely due to his past. And um, and I also think that when you consider they ought to start off 5-0 and if they beat Ole Miss. I'm not saying they should beat Ole Miss, but I think it's a toss-up. So they beat Ole Miss, you know, that's a – well, excuse me, 4-0. They ought to start off 4-0 heading into that Texas A&M game. Then you're talking about Nick Starkle under center, Rakeem Boyd, a couple of guys with a chip on their shoulder. It's not a bad recipe. They played Texas A&M pretty well last year. That was really probably the defense's best game last year. All right, everybody, I'm going to join Danny West here. Let me bring up his graphic, and we'll bring Danny in to talk a little bit about Razorback recruiting, among other things. Danny West, paging Danny West. What you know? What's up, Danny? You all right, man? What's happening? Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting here watching this pitcher's duel. Oh, Ole yeah. Miss, Texas A&M. What you got going? Well, we just had a little conversation with Pete Roulier. And yeah. before I jump into it, I want to re-remind everybody to get your questions in for Danny. We're going to shoot some bull a little bit and talk some stuff, and then we'll get into a few questions. If you guys got some, you can follow the show on Facebook Live YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. I want to encourage you to throw us a thumbs up if you're watching the show. If you're listening to the show on podcasts, throw us five stars. Throw us a review. Be sure to hit the subscribe button, like, share, follow, comment. All those great things help us get our message out. But as we say, only if you want to. If you don't like what we're doing, then uh, then don't give us a review. So, Danny, a couple of things to bring up here. Uh, Arkansas with a big offer day yesterday. You want to get into some of these offers that they that they've sent out, and and why the sudden flood today or yesterday? Well, I'm not sure there's a specific reason why. They're just kind of getting toward the end of the spring evaluation period here. Uh, you know, they're trying to make one final push. Uh, in fact, I think some of the coaches uh, today is their last day uh, being out for the spring evaluation period. So, I mean, yeah, you, you want to get out and see as many as you can here towards the end. Sorry, my phone's blowing up here. You're another right. offer we just can't hear out, it. Trey, but, oh, another one. Um, <laughs> yeah, Joshua Robinson, whoever this young man is, congratulations on that offer. But my phone is <laughs> blowing off the hook here. Um, yeah, like you said, a whole bunch of offers this week. I'll tell you one, uh, yesterday, kid out of Tulsa. I say Tulsa, he's at Broken Arrow. So, uh Marion Horn, he's a 2022 Mm -hmm. defensive back, so still, you know, long way out for him. But I watched him last night, really impressive. And over the last week, Trey, he's picked up his first three offers. And that's the fun part about a spring evaluation period. You know, these kids coming out, they come out of nowhere. You've never heard of these kids, Mm -hmm. didn't even know Arkansas was looking at them. Then all of a sudden, this guy picks up Baylor. Arkansas and Oregon within a six day span. So that's how it happens. He's a 5'11, 175 pound cornerback. Uh, so he was offered by Mark Smith yesterday. He's really the, the one I would call notable, you know, because he mm-hmm. is from BA. It's really close. Yeah. They've, they've had a little bit of success in Tulsa. So maybe one to keep an eye on there. Good to get on, in on these guys early, and I'll say that's one thing that has stood out about this staff is they they do not shy away from offering kids and getting out in front, and that's what you got to do in this day and age. In, until the NCAA comes in and says, hey, um, you can offer a written scholarship to anybody at any moment, then this is how things are going to go. Until you are bound to that written scholarship, which means you have to send the player a letter of intent, until you're sure. bound with that, then – People are going to, you know, send out as many offers. And that was one of the things I thought was the downfall for Brett. There were several. But one of the things was, you know, the rules, the way they're set up. First of all, the rules are set up to encourage hurry up, up tempo, fast paced offenses. And, you know, he, he ran a more methodical style, which I still say I prefer that type of offense. 
uh, that type of football, just letting your defense get set up and, you know, this is our defense, this is your offense, let's play ball. But the rules are not set up that way. Their new rules are set up to favor up-tempo offenses, so I don't want to digress too much. But the same thing with recruiting. The rules are set up to just send out as many offers as you want, you know. Um, odds yep. are the kids aren't going to commit until they've taken an official visit to your school or a visit at least to your school so, and when you have an opportunity to really evaluate them. So you might as well take advantage of the way the rules are because everybody else is. And um, that's something that I like about this staff. They're taking advantage of the rules the way they're written right now. So, um, Danny, we're 100 days out, 100 days out from start of football season. You got a vacation coming up, though, in, what, two days? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking (laughs) forward to it, man. I saw a kid tweet the other night that he announced his announcement date of Mm. when he's going to trim his list. Oh, yeah, that's that's important. Vacation. (laughs) <laughs> vacation can't get here quick enough man i'm ready to throw this dadgum phone <laughs> as far into that ocean as i can get it so yeah no i'm looking forward to that the important thing yeah, about a vacation is up. to be ready to come home is to be ready yeah. to come back from vacation that's how you know you did it right but yeah, I, I hear right. you man it's it's you, you have to understand i mean and you understand this that um for these kids it's their first time going through the recruiting process and for us it's you know the up teenth, you know, however many times sure. we've been doing this. And it is always interesting to see a an announcement about an announcement for an announcement. Yeah. I mean I I'll just say this. Some of these kids couldn't play for Clay Toddy. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> There's zero chance. No Clay chance. Toddy. Uh, <laughs> can you tell the dog in the fight story? I'm not going to, I'm not going to put people through that. That's a very, <laughs> that's a special story that people should have to earn in life. You know, I mean, it's Facebook. I know it's free, but mm-hmm. you should have to pay for that story in my opinion. Okay. I hear you. <laughs> it's a life lesson. Trey. Those aren't free. <laughs> life lessons aren't free. All right. So we got a hundred days out from football. Danny West going on vacation. You know what I was thinking about Danny is we're coming up so we're 100 days out from football. The last time Arkansas had uh, an announcement about the the restructuring, or if you want to call it the unveiling of their uniforms, was July last year. And really, that was just an alteration, right? So that was like July yeah. 10th. The June 13th, 2012, that's a long time to be with the same uniforms, is the, the time that they announced their last uniform. So we're probably – anywhere from a few weeks to a month and a half at most before they probably announce uh, new uniforms for Arkansas. And I assume they're announcing new uniforms. That's what we've been told. We, we hear that they're going to announce new uniforms. But what are you looking for in these, in these new ones? I'm expecting new uniforms, and I think there could be um, some, what do you call them, alternate, um, mm-hmm. alternate yeah, uniforms Yeah, there's always going to be alternate, that- yeah. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed what they did with the 1964 national championship throwback, yeah. which I guess was in, you know, shoot five years ago, 2014 season. So mm-hmm. I like stuff like that. Bring back some of the more traditional type stuff. I think, I think fans enjoy it. You know, I think the players, sure, absolutely. They're, they're all for, it. you know, any, any adjustments you do, but really to me, it ought to be about the fans and the players, of course, but yeah, if you bring back some more traditional stuff, and I don't even know what that is because, you know, people like to say the McFadden era was mm-hmm. the traditional Arkansas uniform. Well, really, it wasn't. No, I mean, they never Arkansas had Arkansas been, over the chest. No, yeah, right. they never had that. And, uh, you know, they've changed it so many times. People want to say, well, when 2000s rolled around as well, really when they started changing it. Mm-hmm. But, man, you can go back. I mean, way back in the day, they had white helmets. I mean, there's been a million changes on this uniform. So there really is no traditional, uh, you have to stick with this type deal. Personally, I want to see the Razorbacks come back on the sleeve, the outside sleeve. Yeah, I thought that's been missing, and uh, it's noticeable. Uh, I mean, you don't want to blend in and kind of look like everybody else at some point. I think you got to bring that part of it back, no matter what the rest of the, the uniform looks like. Well, my personal take is, first of all, don't act like you didn't strut around in your uniform when you're in seventh grade in your jersey for about an hour around your house after you got it. It does. It's, it is important to the players. It's important to recruits. Those ought to be 
things that are definitely taken into consideration. You also need to feel like you're watching Arkansas when you look down on the field. And for me, you know, I think more early 90s, um, yeah. I guess late Very 80s, money. you know, yeah, just with the numbers on the chest, you didn't have to put Arkansas up there. You had the Razorback on the sleeve, double stripe down the pants, Razorback on the, uh, on the front of the pants. And that was the jersey to me. I love the McFadden jerseys. That was the first time they put Arkansas across the chest. Wouldn't mind seeing, wouldn't mind seeing some type of modern look combined with a classic look. The thing is, you don't want to get too tricky, too like you know, like the faded yeah. jerseys and the mat and the you know all these yeah. decals up on the front. You want to keep it clean, you know. But I do think it's yeah. interesting that you went since 2012 all the way to 2019 without a change in the uniform because. Literally since I can remember, since Arkansas has been in the SEC, I guess it's they have changed uniforms every two years. Yeah, that's right. I'll tell you a uniform that gets overlooked quite a bit was the early Matt Jones. Uh, I want to say like two thousand one, two thousand two. Right there was a eight. there was an Adidas and a Nike version of that jersey, but it was basically the yeah. the black outline on the number. That's right. Yeah. I, I thought that real subtle black outline. Yeah. Uh, no letters up top, had the hogs on the sleeves and the long red socks, man, with those white pants. Yeah. Matt Jones made that look pretty sharp, man. I it's, like the it's way that simple, but you knew you you knew who you were watching when you saw that one. I like the way the NFL does it and requiring you to wear the long socks. I just think it looks better. Yeah, it's it a, does it's, look a better. it's a better look. Um but yeah, I agree with you. Those Matt Jones jerseys were were pretty good. I had a breakdown. I'll have to find it somewhere, but I had a breakdown of all of Arkansas's jerseys over the past, um, you know, 25 years or so, uh, not too long ago on Hog Sports. I need to find that and kick that back up. And like I said, probably not too long before we see some type of unveiling. And this would be the first Chad Morris unveiling because the last uniforms, all they did really, they took the mat, they took the, the mat out of the helmet and, and changed it to pearl. And they took one of the tusks off. I think that was all that they did on the on the new ones. But those were signed yep. off by Brett, by Brett the by Brett Bielema. What's his name, Trent? Brett Bielema. <laughs> Brett Bielema. Uh, so Brett Bielema. yeah. So um, I guess Chad would have signed off on these probably. Yeah. Late last year. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't a whole lot he could have done in in first year. You mm-hmm. know, everything was already in place, like you said there. But yeah, it's that time of year, man. Uh, I mean, shoot. You start talking about uniforms, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I just picked up my first uh, preseason college football magazine the other night. Where'd you get it? And uh, I went to the store the other a, day and got it find at Walmart one. and mm-hmm. found a Street and Smiths um, magazine. The only reason I got it is because it said it used our recruiting rankings, twenty four seven rankings inside. So uh, mm-hmm. here's here's my eight bucks, buddy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what about Phil Steele? When's this coming out? I don't. That's, he's that's always the real late. Deal. It, yeah, he's he's the real deal. You got to get it. He's always like, I want to say second week of June, something mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah, I was hoping uh, I was hoping to go on vacation with that book in hand, but I guess not. You know, it's interesting. Those things are so outdated now with everything on the internet, but they're still fun. I still find yeah. joy in going, and it's kind of like a refresher. Go through it and kind of brush up on some things before the f- football season starts. When I was a kid, I used to – so when I was a kid, I would um, – and in high school and even in college, um, you know, I would be out working at my dad's uh, plant, and um, I would that's what I did in the summers I worked. Or I'd be out in the field working um, in the pecan orchard, and I would have, you know, those magazines just kind of yeah. – every time I could sneak off with a highlighter and stuff, like going over stuff. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Those yeah, are, man. I – uh you know, I think I've told you the story before, but I actually, when I was in eighth grade, I wrote Phil Still a letter. And <laughs> it's a true story now. I, I wrote him a letter and said, one of these days I'm going to work for you. And I want to say two years ago, uh, Bo Mattingly had him as the uh, guest speaker at the Fayetteville, you know, touchdown club, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually got to go up there and meet Phil Still. And I told him, hey, when I was in eighth grade, I wrote you this letter. And so one day I'm going to work for you. And you never wrote me back. <laughs> <laughs> that was a so great I totally ending. Put him on, I, I totally put him on the spot. A great ending there yeah. to your story. All right, Danny. So what else going on here? You've uh, recently released a big red board for defense and haven't released the, the big red board for offense in a little bit. What's up? No, 
now since the last week. Um, yeah, I've been trying to rotate those and do them once a week mm-hmm. because, you know, this time of year, not a lot changes. And, yeah. it, you know, I hate to put one out with, you know, very minimal changes on it. I feel like I'm kind of ripping people off in that sense. So it's, try, you know, it's a balancing act. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, maybe I'll throw one out before I head on vacation just to update it. But not a lot of new news, man. I mean, you know, everything's coming up in June. Of course, they're going to have a couple of camps that I've really, and of course, I'll be at all of them that they have on, on mm-hmm. campus, but really the dates I'm circling are the 14th and the 15th. On the 14th, uh, that morning, they start with the offensive line, defensive line, what we know as the uh, the Trench Hogs camp, right? So they're mm-hmm. going to do that one in the morning, and then that afternoon, it's going to be the Passing Academy camp. So uh, that'll be a full day, followed by the next day, You've got the Hog Wild Elite Camp, and that's when all of your in-state schools it, uh, will be on hand, and, and they I think they're expecting seven hundred and fifty kids. <laughs> at least at least that. they're going to be three fields to put them on. We went to that a few years that's ago, at, at War Memorial Stadium, they had seven hundred fifty kids on one field. Man, that was that was brutal. That was rough. I've never seen I've never seen anything like it before. I don't yeah, know, I don't know I how either. how anybody thought it, yeah. that was a great idea, and they were like. Two SEC level prospects there, Jacoby Criswell and um, uh, uh, Mont- Monteric, uh, Monteric Brown. Monteric Brown. Yeah, and that yeah. Was, and that was it. Speaking of Jacoby, you're going to love this question. Got a uh, question about Jacoby Criswell. Uh, is Arkansas making a mistake? I'm not targeting him more heavily. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, they they could be. I mean, they could be making a mistake on a lot of kids. But mm-hmm. uh, I get the question. He's an in-state guy. Actually, uh, I follow Jacoby on Instagram, and last night somebody asked him a question in one of his stories, um, quote unquote stories on Instagram, and he, uh, I think he listed Texas A&M, Auburn, North Carolina, and Alabama as the four schools he's really looking at right now. So, mm. no mention of Arkansas, which I, you know, I wasn't expecting. Oh, you'd, to already, see Arkansas you'd already you'd already removed him from your uh, the Big Red Board, yeah. people under consideration yeah. for Arkansas. Speaking of quarterbacks, Danny. Chandler Morris is obviously the guy that a lot of people have their eye on. Haynes King keeps bringing Arkansas up, but I mean, if they get sure. Chandler Morris, I mean, aren't they pretty much done at quarterback? I mean, those two guys I aren't think, going to uh, the same school. I think it would be really, really difficult to uh, to get both of them, no matter which one jumped on board first. And you know, my money is probably still on Chandler at this mm-hmm. point. I don't think he's decided by any means, but. Haynes has still got a lot of options out there, man. And, uh, you know, I had somebody ask me on the board who I think is better. And, you know, really it doesn't matter who I think is better. It, it's all about, you know, Chad Morris, Joe Craddock, whatever they come up with. So, mm-hmm. and my, my wife is calling me. So clearly not a fan of the show. Mm-hmm. So sorry about that. We but, can't, uh, we can't hear when anybody calls you, Danny. Okay, good. Yeah. That's good news. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, by the way, that was brought to you by Buck Joyner, that question. Terry Roy says, Arkansas offense is going to be different this year. Johnny Brooks says, who's going to be the quarterback recruit in 2020? That's uh, probably Chandler Morris. And if something happened, something would have to happen where he's like, hey, Dad, I want to – I think I want to explore one of these other options and, you know, kind of sure. go out and do my own thing. Then possibility for Haynes King, who has a ton of offers, just keeps getting more and more popular amongst uh, recruiting analysts also. Uh, but as well, he should. Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot he's about got Chandler all the and, and take nothing away from Chandler. I think he's really, really impressive. Yeah, you would like him to be a few inches taller, but he is what he is. But mm-hmm. you know, Haynes King, let's not take anything away from this guy. I mean, just go watch his film. He's a, he's a stud. Mm-hmm. So anyway, what else you got, Trey? Uh, Terry says again. Um, this year will determine how good of a coach Chad Morris is. I've said numerous times it's not your three, but. You always say, you know, you get four or five years to get a pro- football program turned around, but the great coaches seem to do it in three years. And Morris is doing – I mean, he's making the moves. And it's crazy how similar some of the things he's doing compares to some of the things that Eric Musselman is doing. I mean, here Musselman is bringing in four transfers, two grad transfers and two younger transfers. Uh, and this is now a five-man class with, um, with Hill already on board. So – I think it, I, th- I just think it's incredible how similar these two coaches have been so far in their approach to building their roster. But um, let's see. Todd Drake says, "Are you hearing that? Are you hearing the 
last assistant basketball coach is going to come from the NBA. I have heard some discussion on that. I've heard the AAU side. That's quite two different candidates. But, uh, we, you know, we talked with Musselman. Was that last week we talked to Musselman where he was saying – We could go today. You know, he was we kind of chiming today. in with – uh, some of the players about what they would um, what they would like in a uh, in an assistant coach, which I think I think is really key. It, it improves your player buy in, makes them feel more invested to the program. Um, Bobby Tony says, "What's wrong with the quarterback in Arkansas High School? Thinks it's Clarksville. I don't know. Do you know anything on that, Danny? Uh, no, I haven't." I have you know, no idea what he's talking about. Sorry um, about that. Any idea what position group is going to be next to commit? He wants to know the group, not the player, the group. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Well, I'll tell you, the, the group is always the easiest. When you start getting into the early summer months, that's mm-hmm. when you start to see some of your quarterback prospects start to make a move there. So I would probably go quarterback. Um, I'm trying to think of official visitors who came in. Tight end, Brandon Fraser. he said when he left here, that uh, he wanted to do it in late spring or early summer, which is kind of what we're into now. So Mm. I would keep an eye on that one. Uh, And then, you know, that 14th, the 12th through the 15th coming up in June, I think could uh, potentially produce a couple, maybe a few guys for them. So uh, hard to tell until we get closer to that. All right, Danny. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And um, I guess uh, any final words of wisdom you want to, you want to provide. No, man, just thank everybody for listening. Like you said, I'll be out next week, so don't bother me. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be sure to leave you alone. All right, Uh, Danny West with hogsports.com. You can read all of Danny's stuff on hogsports.com. He writes most of our VIP type of content, and I want to go ahead and mention that hogsports.com right now is just a dollar for your first month. So sign up at hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com, or you can sign up for a year and take a seven-day free trial and get 30% off your first year at hogsports.com. And a lot of stuff coming up here in the month of June with football camps, uh, their last visit date coming up. So uh, a lot of stuff happening in June as far as football recruiting goes. And, and of course, July, too. July, well, at least last year, was a huge month for recruiting. Um, before we sign out here, I want to remind everybody again, Facebook Live, YouTube, or ways to watch. It's always loaded on hogsports.com for the members out there. Uh, You can always listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Throw us that thumbs up. If you haven't done so now, go ahead and give us that thumbs up. If you're listening on podcasts, throw us five stars and give us a review. So, any last words I have? Can't think of anything. Let me make sure that I've got all of our questions down. Um, Outside of quarterback, where we see the biggest area of improvement in 2019, I think overall defense you could see. If they can stay healthy on defense overall, I think you could see a good bit of improvement there. Also at wide receiver uh, and tight end with Hudson Henry uh, joining the fold there. But wide receiver with guys like Traylon Burks and Trey Knox, Jamar Nash, TQ Jackson, I think that's going to uh, increase things a lot. Um, when do we expect commit uh, commitment from uh, French, Martavius French, linebacker out of Whitehaven? He says July 23rd. So that's right before – the uh, kickoff cookout, which, um, you know, could see a lot of uh, commitments there. Arkansas will have to be firm on who the quarterback is this year and not have a merry-go-round. I could see him going back and forth a little bit, though, uh, Terry, um, early on and before they settle on somebody. But hopefully it works its way out in the uh, in camp. But it's good to have some good competition there. Okay. I want to thank you for joining us again. We're going to try to do these moving forward on Mondays and Thursdays, so you can look forward to those. Um, And, yeah, that pretty much does it. So, for Danny West, for Pete Roulier, this has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, and we'll catch you next time.